Um, what I would um, just like to do is to, is to thank all the uh, relatives of Dr. Abdurrahman and his, who are here today, particularly uh, because, you know, I really treasure your, your participation and I hope to goodness I have done a decent job because, uh, you know, I really, really hope I've, I've worked hard on this, but the, he's not an easy person to, to write about. Um, and um, I mean, particularly because unfortunately a lot of his archive has been lost and that does make it tough. So this is a view mostly from uh, published sources, other people's views, uh, newspaper articles, the things that he wrote in um, his, the own news, his own newspaper that he ran, the, the APO, or the African People's Organization, which he, uh, Af African Political Organization, which, which was the paper of his, of his party. Um, so there is something of him in here, but by no means enough. And that is one of the great sadnesses of writing about Dr. Abdurrahman. Anyway, let me, before I go any further, oh, I also must welcome Karen Duplessis, with whom I wrote my last book, and my greatest supporter and toughest critic, um, Andrew Whitehead, who was my former editor at the BBC, who is here. And oh my goodness, what will he say about me? Uh, I dare, I, I, I shudder to think. Anyway, I'm just going to now share the screen and try and get, if I can, and get the, um, get the uh, PowerPoint going. Uh, right, um, here we are. I hope that's, is that working for everybody? Okay, good. Right, here we are, Dr. Abdurrahman, South Africa's first elected politician. And I will try and get through this as fast as I can, because there are quite a lot of slides. Um, a very quick summary of who he was, born in Wellington, 1872. It's about an hour and a half, something like that, north of Cape Town, lovely little village. Um, he lived in a poor part of the village and he came from a Muslim family. He was the grandson of slaves, probably from India, or at least is on one side, uh, but his family had done quite well. And uh, by the time they moved to Cape Town, they were able to send him to um, Maritz, Maritz uh, Brothers and then to Sachs, a South African college school. Um, and you can actually see in that, um, uh, the slide, you can see that is him sitting right at the back. He was one of the very few um, people of color ever, elect, ever allowed to go to the school. I actually went there too, briefly for one year. Um, he then goes to the University of Glasgow and studies medicine from 1888 to 93. And he was by no means the first uh, person of color to come from uh, uh, South Africa to study in at the University of Glasgow and at Scottish universities. And there's a very strong connection between Scotland and um, South Africa and people of color in South Africa who came and learnt and in, in, in uh, Scotland. Uh, I mean, one of the greatest early South African um, missionaries and scholars and uh, journalists, Tito Sawyer, was there from 1885 to 1850, 1855 to 1857. And Sawyer's son, William, was with um, Abdurrahman at the same time. So you have a, a really rich relationship which goes through essentially the missionaries. And I've provided a, quite a lot of reading that people can have a look at if they're interested in that. Anyway, he doesn't just uh, work. He meets this lovely woman, uh, Helen, always known as Nellie Potter, um, who was uh, in, in, the, in the vicinity. He, he meets her and he marries her. And it was a brave move on her, her part because she, had, she became Muslim although she never changed her religion, but she became, she was married under Muslim rights. He told her that she would probably face discrimination. Despite that, he was a handsome man. She decided to go with him to Cape Town. And uh, in 1902, they finally make their, their, their journey to Cape Town, although they've been backwards and forwards and he establishes a practice. Um, does extremely well and soon begins to be involved in politics. In 1904, he is elected to the city of Cape Town uh, Council, the first person of color ever to be elected in South Africa. So don't believe this, this, this sort of suggestion that, that 
people could only vote in South Africa if they were, um, you know, uh, of color from uh, after the end of apartheid, from the 1830s right the way through until the, the 1930s, for nearly 100, 100 years, people of color voted in the Cape province. It was then actually stripped away from people, which is one of the worst parts of the racism that, that South Africa has faced. Um, here we are, we have the register of members of the General Council of the uh, University of Glasgow. And you can see Abdurrahman here. There he is, he graduates, his brother graduates um, some time later, and his daughter also graduates, all become doctors. So there's a really powerful link between the Abdurrahman family and the University of Glasgow, one of which I think I'm sure you are proud of. Um, here we are. He remains on the city council for 36 years, def defeated only once, uh, to, to everybody's surprise. I think it's certainly him his own. He's then elected to the provincial council, one of the very few, I think there are only two or three that become elected to this. He leads a delegation to India in 1925 and dies in 1940. So how does he manage to do all of this? To go back to this, I just want to go very briefly through the, the sort of history of South Africa. Uh, the discovery in, of golden diamonds transforms the country. And here you see a picture of Market Square in Johannesburg. Um, and within 10 years of its foundation, the discovery of gold, it was as large as Cape Town and uh, you know, a major city. So the, the whole focus of attention in South Africa had moved from the ports to the interior and the British, it didn't escape the notice of the British. War came to South Africa in the form of the Anglo-Boer or South African War. And I, I just put this up apart from the, suggesting you should of course drink nectar tea, um, is this uh, fantastic picture. You see just how many of these ships there were as they poured um, horses, artillery and troops through the, uh, through the Cape Town docks. Sometimes the docks were so full they had to double berth. They had to put two of the ships next to each other. It brought huge wealth to the town. And this is a description of um, what it, how it had been transformed. It, from the sleepy town to this wonderful lofty buildings, palatial houses and all the rest of it. It, this was a, a very much a propaganda uh, booklet, but nonetheless accurate. And that was a picture, by the way, of the Cape Town Parliament, which is still used as a parliament in South Africa today. Uh, the main street, uh, that's Adderley Street, you see it with the, with the uh, carriages and uh, uh, the lion's head in the background. And uh, I think that's the Standard Bank, actually. Um, what you see, the gap in the left is where there's now a station, and that was the station then. So it's now seen, wouldn't disgrace any European city twice its size. But there's another side to the city, which is the, uh, the poverty that there was there as well. 170,000 people in 1904. And as you can see, people came from all around the world, all sorts of people. They were the poor, the rich, Jewish secondhand dealers, restaurant owners from Madeira, prostitutes from St. Helena and so forth and so on. As you see, the, 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 the city is built around this parade. There's a fortress there, that is the parade, and that is the really important place because that was where people used to go to buy vegetables, but also to demonstrate. And that's where people held many of the demonstrations. The Malay Quarter um, uh, is uh, on th this side of town, the, the eastern side of town, and just to use South African terminology, um, Abdurrahman would have been called a colored, a Cape colored at the time. And he was within that, he would be in a subset, which were the Muslim group who were called the Malays, even though many of them didn't come from Malaysia. Um, sorry. He built a house for himself and his wife, or he, he got this made in on the other side of the town, Albert Lodge, which soon became a wonderful place where everybody of influence came and met, wh whether they, whoever they were, they'd come see him where there were visitors from abroad, there were people who needed advice, and he set up, that was where he was based. Um, but District 6 was also a place of great poverty. In 1901, these 
buildings housed terrible conditions. Many of the people, as you can see, this is a report. Uh, there was an outbreak of, um, of bubonic plague. And you can see how the circumstances in which people lived, utter misery. And I, I hope you can read what is, what is on this slide, but it, is, it was just appalling. So you've got rich and poor living side by side, which was of course one of the reasons why the South African government eventually demolished District 6, because they didn't like the fact that people of all races lived there. Um, there's a, a close up of the parade. You can see how people are trading, but often they were a place of demonstration. Um, the Anglo-Boer War is, is often forgotten that it was a left-wing cause. It received the backing of the left, including the Labour Party with Keir Hardy, who lost an election over it. We talk about stop the war um, demonstrations against the Iraq War. People forget that the first stop the war campaign was against the Anglo-Boer War. People of colour also fought on both sides in the war. But when the Treaty of Vereniging was signed in 1902, and it was a treaty, it was not a surrender. Um, the, it was essentially between only the whites and the, the Afrikaners extracted a lot from the British in order to have peace. Particularly, they, they, they insisted that they should decide what color policy was in the country once it got independence again. As I pointed out, the, the people were enfranchised as early as 1836, by 1904, they represent 3.7% of the population, nearly 15,000 voters, and they are critical in at least five of the constituencies of, uh, in, in the country. And of course, um, they, politicians, white politicians took notice of them. When he returns in 1902, he establishes his practice. He then gets involved in a school, one of the great passions of Dr. Durman's life, and he later was, it's probably the thing that he's best known for actually, is the many schools, both ordinary schools and Muslim schools that he um, brought about. At this period, there were already political meetings going on just above District 6, a place called The Stone. Anybody could attend on a Saturday or Sunday and there would be discussions. Um, in September, 1902, the African political organization is, is um, founded. And in 1904, Dr. Abdurrahman is elect, elected to the city council, despite the opposition of the left um, at the time. At that time, they had about 10,000 members. They were already a powerful organization. And the following year, he's asked to become the leader of, of the organization, which he does. And he leads it for the rest of his life until 1940. Um, he goes to London in 1906, leading a delegation from the APO, precisely to, to call for the rights of colored people not to be treated like Africans, because he, he thinks that in the, in the wording of the Ferenachen Treaty, there is a loophole which talks about natives, and I mean, the terminology of the time, and Dr. Abdurman argues that no, that colored people were not. They had a European, partly a European heritage. It's rejected by London. And uh, from that moment onwards, he basically starts campaigning for everyone of color. He realizes that there's no hope of going down a separatist sort of colored path and he fights for the rights of everybody. By 1910, they have 10,000 members, a national network. But the great question they always had to ask themselves, they were still a minority in the country, who were their, their allies? Were their, their allies the different white parties or should they work with the African population? That was one of the problems they dealt with throughout the, their entire history. It was one they never really um, managed to, uh, uh, to successfully um, resolve. Here we have something that few people know about. There we are, Keir Hardy, leader of the Labour Party, on a, on a round the world tour, goes to Cape Town. And there he is in Cape Town. You can see him at the Socialist Federation. And he, he goes there, having already been in the Transvaal, where he had a terrible time. He was campaigning for non-racial unionization. And when he spoke in the Transvaal, he was so uh, heckled and they literally thought they were, going to, they were going to storm the stage and throw him off, the white trade unionists. He flees from the hall 
taking with him the Union Jack, which he hangs in his study, which is in fact just off Fleet Street in London. And there you see him, uh, but he was a powerful supporter of the non-racial position in South Africa. After the war, Britain had really only one aim, and that was to unite all the four colonies they now owned, to end the, the rift between Afrikaners and English, and to uh, bring the Transvaal, Orange Free State, Natal and the Cape together as the Union of South Africa. But there was always going to be a cost, and the cost was going to be in terms of the black population. So you get a series of letters which are written from the Cape Prime Minister, um, Merriman, to the Transvaal um, uh, leader of the, um, I think he was the Minister of the Interior then, Smuts. And you can see there, he, Merriman argues, he says, God forbid I should advocate a general enfranchisement of the native barbarians. All I think is it requires for our safety is that we do not deny him the franchise on the count of color. We can then snap our fingers at Exeter Hall, which was where the uh, Aborigines Protection Society met, and Downing Street, and experience teaches me that there's no surer bulwark of all legitimate rights for any class and color than representation in parliament. Smuts replies, we can't possibly do that because at the moment in the Transvaal, which is which he represented, any man who was white had the right to vote as long as he was 18. And if you, they wanted to go to a situation where there'd be a franchise which required people to have either money or property, it would disenfranchise 10,000 Bavuaners, sub farmers or squatters, and their grown up sons of farmers. And he says, we cannot do that. And from his point of view, it was an unanswerable case. As a result, when the Union of Constitution is drawn up, Merriman extracts from uh, Smuts the, the assurance that the Cape vote, which was a non racial vote, but one which you had to have property or or money would re be retained and that it would, but it would not extend to the rest of the country. And Dr. Duraman, together with a whole group of other people, there you see uh, W.P. Schreiner, there you see he was a former Cape Prime Minister, that is Abduraman, and the rest are both white, black, and colored people come together for the very first time and they lobby London. Unfortunately, London does not answer and does not accept it. The government was already involved in important debates about imperial defense. And since it was 1909, they already knew the First World War was coming. They knew it was vital that they brought other people in. So you see New Zealand, Canada, as well as people say from the Transvaal there. And the British did not grant the request that Shriner Abdurrahman asked that the right to vote should be extended to the whole country. You there see, this is a later Imperial Conference, and there is Boerter standing at the Imperial Conference supporting the British position because he had fended off the right to vote. There were atrocious uh, criticisms of Keir Hardy. You see Keir Hardy there, and there is Shriner. Um, I needn't read it out to you, but you see the kind of abuse that he faced in the Johannesburg newspapers for the stand that he took, which was to give the right to vote to everybody. One thing they did was to give a, a, a meal for the, the entire delegation led by Shriner. There you see Abdurrahman, Kia Hardy, and the people who were going to lead the African National Congress, Rubusana, Jabavu. These people first get together in London. And that's the beginning of it. Here we have um, in 1910. <laughs> Sorry, we've got somebody's uh, microphone on. Um, in 1910, the union comes about, and it is as Shriner and Merriman agreed. Only in the Cape would, the, would people of colour have the vote. Great celebrations in Cape Town. Dr. Burman refused to join them. I'm afraid that was essentially the there was a huge dividend for the British in as much as Boerter joins the First World War on the side of the British 
and throws the uh, expel uh, gets rid of German rule in uh, southwest Africa, Namibia, and then goes on to fight in the rest of Africa on behalf of the uh, of, of Britain and in in uh, in in Europe as well. So it was a huge dividend for the British, but the price was paid by people of color. After the First World War, the situation only gets worse. The politics moves, frankly, ever, ever uh, towards the, the right uh, and becomes even worse after 1922 when there's a massive strike on the, uh, on the Witwatersrand in the gold mines. And literally, this was the closest South Africa's ever come to a revolution. It was, it was only, you can see the um, troops who were brought in from the rest of the country. You can see aircraft and tanks were used to crush the miners. Um, and uh, as a result, out of this came a pact government which brought the Labour Party and the, 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 some of the Afrikaans far right parties together. And uh, it was, you know, the rights of people of color was gradually eroded. Now, Dr. Buriman spent years fighting, um, fighting these trends. He got together with um, the people who fought, founded the ANC. He got together with other organizations. I mean, year after year, there were attempts to hold, halt it. it. They never succeeded and it was a great tragedy that he spent his whole, almost his whole life from the First World War through to his death in 1940, trying to resist a trend that was inexorable. In 1925, he is asked um, to go to lead a delegation to India to fight for the rights of Indians who are coming under appalling pressure from the South African government. There you see him, you see his daughter, Sisi Gould and Sarojini Naidu who is possibly uh, one of the greatest uh, women who ever fought in the um, Indian uh, you know, drive for independence. I mean, uh, Andy Whitehead would know a great deal more about her than I do, but uh, he is, she was an extraordinary woman. And he goes to India, he meets the Viceroy, he speaks on their behalf, and he goes and he addresses the Indian Congress session in Kanpur, in, the 19, in 1926 and makes an absolutely impassioned speech saying to the Indians, if only you had weapons and warships, we would drive these, these whites out of, out of the, their rule. They would not be able to stand up to us. He nearly loses his position in the provincial council as a result. One of the great successes that he had was his daughter, Sissy Ghoul, um, who was an amazing woman. She was to the left of him, a member of the Communist Party, fought uh, using essentially the same tactics that he did. But she too, from 1938 until her death in 1951, was on the city council and a, a passionate advocate of non-racialism. He dies in 1940 and quite frankly, his movement dies with him. And that is perhaps one of the reasons why Dr. Abdurrahman is not remembered today in the way that other organizations and people are. Um, this was a description of, the, uh, of, the, of his funeral by a reporter in, at the time. Uh, the whole city came to a halt, thousands attended his funeral and he was um, regarded as one. There was genuine grief uh, throughout the country. There were even Smuts and uh, Herzog, who was the prime minister at the time, sent their condolences. There we have a picture of, of Dr. Abdurrahman towards the end of his life. Uh, a man of huge achievement, who I think has been sadly ignored. And I hope that this book will do something to, uh, to uh, redress the balance. Um, I've put in the chat, how you can get hold of it if you're interested. Anyway, there we are, that's, uh, that's me. The only thing I would like to do, if I might just, is to read you a, um, let me just get rid of this, what was said at the time of his death by the African Traders Union for the Cape Town area. He said, when, when, he, when he heard of his death, he said, his name was Leo Masholo, he said, I believe firmly that I express the feelings of the whole Polynesian community of native people when I say how deeply we feel the death of the late Dr. Abdurrahman. Gone is the only man of color whom the natives look to as a real father. 
a true guide and a sincere member of the human family. South Africa, yes, black South Africa, has lost a pillar of justice and fair play, common sense and hope in the person of the late doctor. That was Dr. Abdurrahman. Thank you, Martin, very much. And I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just clap my hands and let you all put your own applause in the chat. Um, and um, I just want to thank you for that really detailed historical overview. Um, it really struck me as I was listening to you the, the depth of scholarship that you've engaged in, um, the, the struggle to actually remember someone who was forgotten with the movement dying, as you said, in 1940, um, but all the many different ways in which patterns that we see being repeated today, patterns of historical forget forgetting, patterns of imperial defense, patterns of voter suppression, patterns that we see around the desire to halt those who have genuinely engaged in the struggle for the rights of all from engaging in the rights of all, the way that those are being laid down in the story that you have told us of, um, of, of um, Dr. Abdurrahman. And I think you've really, you've really shown the way in which um, stories get forgotten. They are so often told from the perspective of the victors so within the South African struggle, so much of the time we know and we hear about the people who um, from the Rivonia trial onwards were part of the struggle with the ANC up, up to 1990. Um, and um, obviously Mandela and the ANC and that movement over the last 20 years into the South Africa of today. But we don't hear about the people who may have struggled and failed, but who have laid down really important lessons and ways of working and who were equally global figures. Um, so I think you've really given us plenty to think about in that. I'm going to um, hand back to you, Martin, to introduce the music that I know my colleague Tawana is on standby, ready to play for us, that I think is a really interesting piece that you've chosen as a little interlude between what you've just said before we move into some reflections and questions. So do you want to say something about the music that we're now going to hear? Well, it's, it's, it's the music of the uh, Cape Carnival. Uh, it's the, the, the music that people used to uh, play, uh, it's, it's the music of my youth, in, and it's called Here Come the Alibama, which is an extraordinary piece of music. Nobody really knows where it comes from, and it is it's sung even to this day in, 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 and used in, 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 in Cape Town, uh, and it actually welcomes a Southern American Civil War ship that arrived in Cape Town. Now, why it's all been re remembered, I've no idea, but it's a great piece of music. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. Thank you. Tawana, do you want to... Play the
that's absolutely extraordinary. I was just seeing in the chat from Terry that she was saying that um, uh, that her, her parents used to um, speak about this or sing this um, in, in, in childhood. And I was just thinking, I wish that I'd had that rather than, and did those feet in ancient times. Um, it just feels a little more uplifting. Um, just for those people who are just joining us right now, we've just been hearing from Martin. I know some folk are coming in a little later. Yes, we are recording this and um, the presentation will be available afterwards. And Martin's generously made available various writings and documents that he has, as well as plugging his book at the moment. But um, right now, what I'd like to do, rather than um, reflecting myself on the content of um, Martin's talk and presentation, is actually hand over to my colleague Tawana Sitole, um, a fellow Southern African, to really offer a perspective um, from, from listening to what Martin has been sharing with us and from the book. Tawana, over to you. Thank you, Alison. And uh, uh, Martin, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I, I know that you, you, you uh, fitted quite a, a lot into that short space. Um, I think this occasion is particularly um, special as well because we have a uh, family with, with us today. So um, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the conversation as we go. I, <clears throat> I'm quite struck, you know, by this epic story that uh, I'm sure for a lot of people who are unfamiliar with it are uh, asking themselves why they don't know this story or more stories like this. So I, I think that that is um, an acknowledgement to the work you have done to bring this story to light. And I, I, I hope many people um, get hold of the book and manage to read it. I'm, I'm quite struck by um, the link between education <clears throat> and the fight for freedom. Um, so this, this connection with us at, at, at uh, University of Glasgow, um, and, and that journey that, uh, you know, going into education uh, can build into the, the wider uh, fight for freedom. So that's quite striking to me, the migration of people and, and what that means. And I know that um, the, the student movement is quite uh, strong um, as been for the last few years, there've been a lot of um, hotspots that students have really brought to light. and. Uh, so yeah, that is that is one observation that I it, it, that really um, caught me, and the and the movement of people, you know, it is, I think for for a lot of us, um, imagining uh, the journey that uh, Dr. Abdurrahman made in in the in the nineteenth century to Glasgow, <laughs> you know, it's it's amazing to reflect on that and think even now as we are in in the current times how difficult it still is sometimes for people to make these journeys. So it's. Um, it's quite something. I, I, um, I'm also struck, uh, Martin, by the language. As your neighbor, uh, as, a, as a Zimbabwean, I, um, the word colored, is, uh, <laughs> it has a lot of um, uh, you know, history and, and connotations with it. And the fact that it is still in use today, I guess there's something about that, that we, we can maybe explore and um, see what that what that means now you know uh, over all this history but I'm, I'm also thinking about um the treaties the role of treaties uh in these journeys uh the different parties and what their interests are and what their agendas are that lead us to arrive at certain treaties and, and why those treaties you know work for some or don't work for some uh, that's quite interesting to me that the, the idea of uh the defense of the empire being much more important than, uh, you know, uh, the rights to to vote. Um, so the idea of war. I mean, we cannot escape the idea of wars, uh, and where we are still, you know, I, I don't know how many conflicts are going on around the world even now as, as we speak. But you know, we are we are always embroiled in, in these wars. Um, so uh, I guess. Um, to, to just kind of, uh, of course, we, we, we'll talk more, but I, I, I think that the last thing I just want to um, say, I, I, I enjoyed the presentation as well because you put the songs in and you are reminding us that the, the human experience is still there in these struggles because all these epic things that happened somehow 
uh, the family, of course, it's a family story too. So the family were encountering and embracing or you know, grappling with all these big issues throughout all this, but of course, you know, the, the, the human side is there, you know, they're feeling, they're sensing, they are expressing a whole range of emotions. And of course they, they are, you know, listening to the, the soundscape of the time. So I, 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 it's a really, um, I think it's a really nice touch that you, you, you put the songs to foreground this, uh, to remind us of that. So thank you. Thanks. Well, Thanks to Anna. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I, the one thing that, that is, is is difficult in all this is, you know, to and the, the reason I highlighted the the the, the Boer War was because of, it was such a kind of pivotal moment on which everything hangs, because it was the fact that although Britain put one hundred and fifty five thousand troops into the uh, into South Africa to try and crush. 100,000 men, women, children, grannies, grandpas, everybody, not troops, 100,000. And that after two and a half years, they were still incapable of doing it. Mm. Meant that it was a peace treaty, it was not a surrender. And mm. that was why they were unable to dictate the terms to the, to the Afrikaners. And there's, I, you know that 27,000 um, Boer women and children died in the concentration camps um, that the British ran. And one has to say there that probably more than that, black people died who also, their servants who were taken to the camps, we don't even know the number that died there. But the, 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 the fact of this, it, at the end of the war, the women said to the men who were still fighting, there were still 16,000 Afrikaners in the field, some of them dressed in sacks and with sores on their bodies was of malnutrition. They said to them, if you decide to surrender and give, you know, give up the struggle now, or stop the struggle, we accept that. But do not do it for us. We've suffered enough and we'll go on suffering if it's necessary. You can go on fighting. Um, and that kind of, the reason I highlight that is because in a sense, if you look at the fury and the anger of the Afrikaners from that 1900 to, I suppose, 1990, for nearly 90 years, it dominated and still in some ways dominates the, the kind of the spirit of South Africa. If you look at the, the way in which some of the, uh, the clashes that there have been in the last couple of weeks between um, it, on the streets of South Africa about the deaths of some of the farmers, you know, the, the uh, you know, it really in the end goes back to that anger about the way that they were treated. Um, and somebody like Dr. Durman, who was immensely civilized, immensely generous, wide-spirited, warm-hearted person, found it incredibly difficult to come to terms with this powerful fury that they had to that they had to face. Um, and I think that is that is why I sort of look back to that that period because everything sort of flows from there. And it is is almost like vengeance for what what happened what happened to them. It doesn't make it right or wrong. I mean, I, I would I, you know never never say that anything you you can't you can't that's just not the way to look at it. But it it explains some of the things that are are, are happening, and um, you know the, the fact that South Africa is now you can almost say like an exploding society. If you look at how many people, like for example Willie Hendrickson, who's joined us here. Uh, he doesn't live in South Africa, and I welcome him. And I'm, you know, thank you for being with us. Um, I think you live in America, is that right, Willie? I think he does. Um, you know, but, but you know, the, the Abdurrahman family has been blown apart across the world. Uh, I live in London, and that is all comes from this this powerful force, in a sense, that has that rose that came out of those uh, of those events. Um, and as you, as Alison <laughs> rightly says, you know, it is it is the victor who is remembered, um, and it, it, in a sense, both it was both the the Afrikaners uh, parties and now the ANC who are remembered, and nobody else is remembered. And you know, I would just say one one last thing in in, in and then perhaps we can widen this up. In my whole lifetime, there have only ever been two parties that have run South Africa. First, the National Party and Apartheid, 
and then since 91, the ANC. That is not a democracy. Thank, thank you, Martin. Thank you. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on my chat and um, messages. And um, there's a, a lot of people thinking about these, the terminology we use around skin tone, the words we use to describe the color of people's skin. Uh, hugely contested and, and what Tawana was raising, what you've been speaking about and um, uh, uh, the question of uh, of, of blackness, of coloredness, of whiteness. Um, but a lovely question here that's actually come from the family, from Chandra Abdurrahman, uh, who is actually say, asking, I'm really curious to understand why grandpa is referred to as black. So Martin, a question from Chandra and from the family. And I think it's right on <laughs> this, this topic at the moment that we're talking about. It's a, it's a good question. Uh, I, I mean, uh, what would you refer to Obama as? African American? Or would you say that he was white? Or would you say that he's colored? What would you call him? I mean, frankly, I you know I I don't give a damn what 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 people call me, and I you know they can call me any anything they like. I think that the problem really is in South Africa that these term this terminology, which was of course brought about by the apartheid system. Uh, is still in place because the ANC insists that everybody still has to have a color designation because they say it's the only way we can make sure that people who were discriminated against in the past now get a fair deal out of, out of society. Um, other people like the Democratic Alliance say, no, it's time to drop that and say, we will help people based on need, not on color of their, their skin. And this is a completely, these are two totally, they legitimate positions, but they took totally different ones. But it is precisely because color is still such a vibrant and frankly, I think terrible issue in South Africa to this day. Um, that, 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 and you, you know, frankly, I worked in the, in the BBC African service, which I loved doing for nearly, nearly 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, we had arguments every single day because that's what news is. News is an argument. You know, why did you put that headline? What a stupid way to write that story. Ah, you don't know what you're talking about. We wrote it two days ago. Why are you writing it now? That's, that's news. It's always a discussion, it's a debate, it's, it's conflict. At the end of the day, you go and have a drink. That's fine. Nobody ever said to me, I said something because, because I was white or, or, or I was. We attacked each other. We said that somebody was bad because they didn't because it wasn't, because we just disagreed with them. That's the way to go about things. And I'm sorry, but if I would did that in South Africa, it would just be hopeless. I mean, I would be called a racist in, after 10 seconds. Hi, Martin, can I say something? Yeah, Please. do come in, do come in. Can I, you introduce yourself um, first? Martin, if you, um, you know, if we just change the way we think about the world and about people, um, we all, you know, on, on the planet Earth, there was life 1.0 we all ultimately evolved from the very first cell that started on the planet. And through evolution um, of all the animal kingdoms, right up to where we are today, you know, if, if, if we start from, let's say Europe, all Europeans came from Africa 40,000 years ago. So all Europeans have black ancestry. So we are all black. And if we go one step further, we are all apes. If we go one step further, we are all um, ancient um, um, mammals, and prior to ancient mammals, we were ancient reptiles. Prior to ancient reptiles, we were ancient fish. Prior to the ancient fish, we were those multicellular organisms. So we are all just one life form, all the same DNA. There shouldn't be any such thing called race, you know? That shouldn't exist. We are all part of the same organism on this planet. No, I, I completely agree. I mean, but I'm afraid the problem is that race is still a major category and it does inform the way people react and relate to each other. And that's, it's a reality. There's no point in denying it. I mean, I think it's wrong, but you know, I can't deny what, what the reality that's around me, but I completely agree with you. Yeah, so, but the thing is, um, I think our education systems are, are really lacking and fail to inform and the people on the planet. If, if everyone knew we all came from that very same um, um, little multicellular organism, 
we'll have respect for every life form on this planet. We will look after this planet. We will look after everyone else. You know, we can't differentiate. Everything is our cousin. Um, the, the grass, the trees, everything living on this planet, we all relate to. We'll have respect for them. We, we will look after this world. You know, it, it, it's science. It, it, it's, it's about how do we educate everyone on the planet that we are all connected, we are all cousins. You know? well, that's, that's wonderful and that kind of goes to the heart of much of what um, I know we are a tiny part of within the work we do in the, the UNESCO chair, just really trying to think through how is it that people construct conflict in their minds and what might be the, the ways in which we find routes to peace. And I, what, I, what I was really taking from you, Martin, um, here was um, that this is a family story that you've told. Um, it's a Glasgow story that you've told. It's a South African story that you've told. Um, it's a story about um, the Indian subcontinent that you've told. Um, and it's a story about all kinds of different ways of categorizing people and then trying to overcome those categories. Um, and I wonder, I, I was wondering if I might ask you what, what for you was the biggest challenge in trying to write this book and piece together this story that was really, you know, as you said, died with the movement in 1940. Well, the, really, the, the biggest problem was actually uh, getting under the skin of Dr. Adverman when uh, and his family when there's so little of the personal available. I think there are only two or three letters that are that one can read where you actually see what they really thought themselves. Uh, so you're always reading it backwards from other people's views, which is completely unsatisfactory. And I wish it wasn't necessary, you know, but it, it, it was the, the reality. The other thing that I think was really, I mean, let me just give you a couple of examples. His, um, his father was said to, uh, and his fa and mother were said to run a small greengrocer's shop off the parade. I showed you a picture of the parade. Now, how the heck did they send two sons to Glasgow one son to um, I think one son to um, Alaksa University in in um, in uh, Al Azhar University in Cairo. How did they afford all this? They then travelled backwards and forwards to London. They established homes all over the world. How did they do it? I, I genuinely don't know. Um, Doctor Abdurrahim himself has two wives. He leaves uh, Nelly. Um, we don't even know the date on which he left her. And he, he establishes another um, family. Um, and we really don't know. There's a tremendous amount we don't know. So we know the public, we don't know the private. And the private still is private, quite frankly. Maybe that's good, but I found it a, a gap. Um, we found a few documents right at the end of my research, um, which were in a garage. Um, and I've got a few photocopies of those uh, or scans. Uh, but, uh, you know, there is so much still that needs to be done. And to be absolutely honest with you, whether people like the term coloured or not, frankly, the coloured community, there is a huge amount of, of historical work that needs to be done to look at, the, as, at this, this, the, these people, their contribution to South Africa. The, uh, you know, they are frequently now seen as only people who live in poverty and with gangs and violence and drugs. There's another story, which is about their, their strength, their vigor, the education that they had, and the, you know, the respect with which they should be, should be held. And I think that that is what, what, what I was trying to contribute to as well, to say, listen, this, is the, this, this book is by no means the end. I, I hope that other people write a much better biography of Dr. Durman and go out and write biographies of other people of color, whether they're colored, whether they're Indian, whether, they're, uh, of, you know, there is uh, so much more work that needs doing. Absolutely, and I, I what, what I'm really appreciating in, in the way that you've approached this, Martin, is the fact that you've really wanted to take um, a lost history or a hidden history, but also one that is a history of, you know, as you said, struggle to his dying days um, and struggle that was, you know, began in a sort of movement to establish schools and then when, um, and then that became a sort of schools for all movement and a, a movement to try and have treaties respected that then had to um, expand it, itself out. So a real sense of, and you, you use the term tactics there and it was really reminding me of um, some of the work of um, 
de Sarteau, Michel de Sarteau, who talks about the difference between strategies and tactics. You know, that strategies is what the victors have um, as a kind of overview and tactics are what you have to have on the ground to try and keep ducking and diving and dodging and working out what a route might be. And in the biography that you, you presented, the way that you've shown that, you can really see that. But then these paradoxes that are so fascinating, which are, you know, these are, these are gifts to historians and archivists. Um, to see what can be found about a story, as you say, which is how, how did this happen? How was it possible to have this many medical degrees from the University of Glasgow at that moment in history? How was it possible to do this travel? How was it possible to do these missions? Um, so I think there's lots there that is really fascinating me. Um, in the chat, there's been a, a couple more comments, but also um, quite a lot of, of questioning around the categorizing. And maybe you can help us with this, the categorizing of um, who was black and who was colored. And we've got some comments on the pencil test um, and whether you might actually be able to um, refer to that and, and enlighten us a bit more around that. Well, uh, I hate discussing uh, the, the, these blooming categories were relating to apartheid, but uh, they were real. I mean, I grew up with it all my life. Um, and it, the pencil test was an appalling test. How do you know that somebody is uh, African as opposed to colored? Colored, you were supposed to be either Malay background, in other words, a, a, a slave brought from the, uh, from the Indonesia or the, by, by the Dutch, or colored where you were, a, a, you know, a, a mixture between a white settler and, uh, and an African uh, or, or uh, a member of the Khoisan or Hottentot community. And one of the ways of doing it was to the pencil test. So you put a pencil in somebody's hair. If it went into my hair, it would fall out. If it went into Tawona's hair, maybe it would stick. So on that basis, you'd be decide that Tawona was, was uh, an African or a native or whatever you wanted to, I mean, I, I, I hate this bloody terminology. And I would be decided that I was colored or, or white. And that was the pencil test. And every year under the apartheid system, one of the most disgusting things, they actually used to publish how many people this year are now going to be reclassified as colored and how many people colors are going to become Indians and how many Indians are going to become colors and et cetera. I, and, I I entirely agree with you and the way in which that this was then developed into a legalese um, around it. I am minded of um, a, a moment in 2015 when the um, so-called refugee crisis was um, becoming a thing in Europe and um, I suddenly got a phone call from um, one of the um, one of the governments of um, of the United Kingdom saying we need someone who knows about refugees and who knows about semantics and linguistics to explain to us why suddenly nobody likes the language any longer. Um, and it was it was a really interesting moment where I suddenly felt like I needed to give my my 101 lecture on um, semantic shifts, um, which was um, really showing how at times of turbulence and at times of, of dispute, at times of conflict, the categories we normally use come under huge erasure um, as a popular movement. And people genuinely want to shift and leave a, a language behind, a, a lot like the, the renaming of street names after a revolution. And it's one of the signs that you've actually got something of a revolutionary moment happening is when we say these categories don't work, we need other ones. And we're seeing it at this moment in time with things like, you know, a lot of people placing um, um, acronyms like BAME um, under erasure or BME under erasure or categories like refugee or asylum seeker or migrant under erasure, trying to say there has to be a more humanizing language that we can use. And I think, you know, just, just like, like you, Martin, I too, I weary of the debates around language as I see language dissolve and flow and, and move into something else. Um, I've just had a, a request from um, Mondro. Mondro, do you want to unmute yourself and, and ask your, your question or make your comments to Martin? Uh, good day. Uh, can you guys hear me? We can. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. A very quick uh, contribution from my side. Firstly, if just two very quick contributions on my side. The first one quickly would be around the term colored and conversating on the term colored. I think um, I, I'm a big fan of Steve Biko. Steve Biko speaks about the redefining of terms, and he then did this with the term black, along with the, along with the likes of Wim Dubois, along with, along with the likes of you know, Malcolm X, who speak about 
Biko himself even writes about how black is dehumanizing, but still reinforces the idea that one needs to attack colonialism at its very foundation and redefine it. So I think we need to acknowledge the fact that this term is very, very deeply rooted in our, in our, in our communities and then take it from there, allow the youth to create a proudly colored narrative. Um, the second quick contribution would be to, uh, to Martin around, it was something just around clarity, a question around clarity when he spoke about uh, the doctor and, not, and only fighting for what is called now the, the colored people. Um, and then later on then choosing to fight for all African people. Um, in my strives of trying to better understand the colored history, I think one of the things that I've seen is that there's a huge tension between colored and black people in South Africa. And I just want to ask, how does that then contribute to the conversation? Because I think you mentioned the fact that the colored people did not know whether they should side with the white people or with the black people. So how does that add to the conversation of this tension that exists amongst black and colored people? Well, my own history uh, comes from uh, trying to uh, re-establish the trade unions in the uh, 1970s and 80s in South Africa. And I remember handing out leaflets uh, to um, uh, African uh, people, workers, and getting abuse from the colored population at factories, which were just, I tell you, I have never heard worse abuse of Africans than from colored, colored women. It was at the Irving and Johnson down at the docks. I mean, I really unrepeatable, unrepeatable what they said. Um, so, I mean, you know, that is, that is certainly an, an issue. Um, but, you know, at the, at the end of the day, I, I think that there's so much more that we need to, we need to do to um, recognize that, you know, our common humanity, which was the point that was made earlier, um, and you know, I, I completely accept the you know the, the role of of the colonial powers in, in in increasing the problems in this regard. But of course, it wasn't only the the, the colonial powers that 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 began the these issues. Many of them go back way beyond be way beyond the, that period. Um, somebody was talking, I think it was Leslie, about the Kamisa Museum, and I, I I don't know much about it. I have heard about it. But I mean, that sounds like an, a great um, initiative at the castle, which will look at uh, the, the heritage of the of the colored people. Um, I mean, it's not I don't like using these terms, but hey, you know, if, if, if they're there, if, if they reflect a reality, one sometimes has to use them, which is which is a pity. But what the heck can you do? Anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm happy to answer any other questions if there, if there I do. Are. I mean, if you've, if you've got questions, do feel free to pop them in the chat and we'll bring, bring you in or, or raise your hands. I know Gregory has um, his hand raised. Gregory, if you, you want to come in um, and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. But I was also appreciating your point about critical discourse analysis and the need to you know, both understand the way in which terms go under erasure, but also the need to really think critically about their usage um, as a way of hopefully preventing their reusage in future, though being mindful that that critical work can often lead to them being used again, as, as we're seeing at this moment in time in some countries. So, so Gregory, um, do, you want to, do you want to come in? Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Gregory from South Africa. I'm uh, from a place called Bloemfontein center in South Africa and uh, uh, the community where I'm from it's a, it's a colored community and there is a street named after Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman and uh, there's a other couple of streets also named uh, uh, like Fredericks and we don't know who these people are and I'm so glad you highlighted these uh, these uh, because there's not much we can find on, 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 on Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman. You know, that's what actually drew me to this conversation. And uh, what I wanna find out uh, uh, is, uh, uh, you might've touched on, on the subject, but um, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman had close ties with Saul Plaiki, mm -hmm. and it happened uh, around the era of the establishment of, of the ANC in 1912 in the center of the free state. And I, I sort of just wanted to, to know what was his role in the formation of the ANC. 
reason being, I know, and I used to hear these stories uh, from my from my from my grand my, my my grandmother. She used to tell me that, you know, the, the the colored people from Cape Town came up, and there was a settled settlement in the so-called black area called Cape States, and these colored people. Uh, they didn't want to mix with uh, with the natives. They saw themselves as you know in some other way, and they uh, sort of formed a group. And that's where uh, Dr. Abdurrahman came in and assisted these group of people to to get an independent area, which is now known as Heidedal. It used to be called Heatherdale, but the name somehow changed to Heatherdale to an Afrikaans name. So that all happened uh, in the era of the establishment of the ANC. And I, I, I sort of just wanted to know what was the role of, 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 of Dr. Abdurrahman in that era. And then the second question was Fredericks. There's another street named uh, Fredericks. And a Apparently, there was ties between Fredericks and, and Dr. Abdullah Abdurrahman. I don't know if he was the Secretary General of the APO. That's what I suspect. If you, if you, if you, if you maybe can just shed some light on that. And I, 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 I can't wait to buy the book. <laughs> I can't wait for you to buy it. Um, yes, uh, no, no, yes, exactly. That's exactly what uh, Fredericks was. And he was actually, I think he's in one of those slides in going to London with Dr. Abdurrahman. He's there in the slide. Um, the uh, sorry, you, you, the the question you asked um, about. Well, let me just throw throw what, what one point. As I made clear, Dr. Abdurrahman before in before 1909 fights exclusively for coloured rights and tries to establish that as a category. Well, it's not surprising. That was who he's elected by. And if you look at the way that the the ANC fought, the ANC fought for African rights. Gandhi fought for Indian rights in, in South Africa. That was just the way it was. They came together over particular campaigns, but Dr. Abdurrahman was no different from any of the other organizations in fighting for the rights of the people that he represented. It wasn't surprising. That was what his job was. Now he, he then, after 1910, uh, he completely abandons that position and really fights for everybody of color because he thought that was the only way of winning. And he always also made links to other, he, he walked, worked with liberal um, whites, he worked with anybody he could to try and stop what was going on uh, in the country. And that I think is, is something one really needs to be in, bear in mind. Sol Pleike, the secretary general of the, um, uh, of the, the, the uh, first secretary general of the ANC, um, he, he, I mean, I don't know if you know, but after 1912, when the ANC is founded, they actually come to Cape Town to begin negotiations with the government. And they, at the same time, open negotiations with um, Dr. Abdurrahman. And they hold, they hold a meeting at which they decide, which is actually in Dr. Abdurrahman's um, uh, surgery in, in, in Loop Street. Uh, and they, they, uh, they, they discuss, and they say, how can we work together? What can we do? And they, they agree, there's a formal resolution which says the ANC and the, um, and the APO, the, the Dr. Abdurrahman's uh, organization will work closely together and we will fight and we'll campaign. Unfortunately, they never really, it never comes about. And it doesn't come about, I don't think it didn't, didn't come about because of bad will on either side, but anybody who you know, knows South Africa at all will know that, that, that you know, it's a huge country. It's jolly difficult to get around. Uh, you know, communications weren't great. A lot of these people were not rich and it was hard for them to keep, you know, shall we say the dialogue going and they had their own campaigns they had to do. There were, there were other priorities. I mean, goodness me, look, look at what's happening in Britain now with the uh, Scottish Labour Party and the Labour Party in Wales. We, we can hardly, I mean, I'm in the member of the Labour Party and we can hardly keep our organisation together. That's one organisation. So, you know, I really do understand that these things are damn difficult to do, especially as, you know, people like Dr. Durham also had to keep his, his, his he, had to, he was a doctor, he had a business to keep going and he looked after his patients. So I don't blame anybody for failing, 
I think failure, you know, the, 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 great, the great point is to try, and they tried extremely hard. Yeah, thanks, Martin. In, this, in the different struggles that we have within our own work, we often have a bit of a mantra, which is, there's no shame in defeat, um, as a way of recasting that, that sense of, of, um, of, of failure. Um, but I'm actually, I'm, I'm really fascinated by something in what Gregory was saying, but also in what Loisa Jaji was saying in the chat earlier, um, where she was talking about um, the Cape Plains and um, the, um, the clinic that was named after Abd, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman and, and just, you know, the street name there. And I, I think there's something really interesting for historiography that when a history isn't told, sometimes it emerges in really quite surprising places in the street names, in the clinic names, in the school names. Um, and I remember a similar, a similar project that was being done around a little known poet in Germany. And one of the ways into that was to then say, look, well, why is this grammar school named after this little known poet? And why is this pharmacy named after this little known poet? So I'm actually quite struck by the people who've come to this event saying, well, I live Live just down the road from a clinic named after him or I um, live on a street that's just around a that, that's 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 named after him um, but I was wondering if I might bring you in Terry um, if you'd like to speak because there's a lovely um, comment in the chat here where you're saying that your grandmother was um, Dr Abdurrahman's second wife Margaret May Stansfield and they had three children Begum Abdul and Nizam do you want to unmute yourself and maybe say something about this Bit shy. You're a bit shy. We're with you. You're with you. <laughs> no, I just want I just want to say that because um, it was mentioned that he left his first wife, and then my my grandmother wasn't mentioned. And the, the most of us who are here, family who are here, are from the the second family. I mean, obviously, we had contact with with the first family as we were growing up as as kids. Um, but I just wanted to just wanted to make that point. And um, it's just. It's fantastic what's happening here today um, from, from a personal point of view to learn this much more about my grandfather. And it's, it's, just, it's just great. So, you know, my mum was only 14 when, when he died. Um, so I don't think she had a, a great understanding of the history behind him. And I just want to make one point. You've used the word failure quite a lot. I don't see anything that my grandfather's done or other people have done who don't make it big as failure mm. because they are putting out, if you want to put it in, in a you know, natural term, ripples that touch people and what they give out then grows into bigger things. So I don't see it as failure, I see it as starting a process. So I, I'll just say that. I, I, I don't disagree with you. Um... Uh, and by the way, thank you, everyone who has joined from the family. I put my email in. If anybody wants to contact me, you're very welcome to. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure if I can find it, but there was, I mean, one of the reasons that um, I, I used the term failure is that I think in reality, um, the doctor himself felt a sense of failure. And I say that because you know, really for the vast majority of his life or the majority of his life as a politician, he was struggling to just stop things getting worse. I mean, you know, the, the extraordinary thing was that in 1909, when they go to, to London and don't manage to get the vote, the, uh, there was a promise from the, uh, from the British government made by the prime minister that if anybody ever tried to get rid of the, the vote that um, people of color had, ha, color had in South Africa, that the king would intervene. In 1936, when Africans were stripped of the vote, the king did not intervene. And the reason is long and complicated. It ha, in the end, he wasn't, the king wasn't even informed that it had happened at the time. So, but the reason was essentially that um, uh, Hoff, um, uh, that the prime minister had the south african prime minister uh, had managed to actually get a position where south africa is essentially a, an independent country and they didn't refer to the uh, to the king via the, via the british government that's why but let me just read to you what dr abdurman said at the his last conference in the apo in 1939 
The age of chivalry, tolerance and kindness has passed away and an age of fear of unreasoning suspicion and a blind prejudice with, uh, um, is def with its deformed offspring of union of these two have usurped its place. True learning is in the course of liquidation. Fresh, constructive, far-sighted and dispassionate thinking is in an awful discount and mere lip service is being paid to the great pure principles of love already distorted by racial bias. That is, its original purity and simplicity can no longer be found or even recognized. Now that was his last conference. And I think that it's legitimate to say that somebody who uses those words at the end of a long and um, you know, hard fought life recognizes a sense of, of failure. Uh, I don't think of him as a failure in any shape, way or form. I think that he was a great uh, person and somebody who contributed to our history and will be remembered and, and will be remembered in much more powerfully in future. But I think he thought that he hadn't succeeded in halting with the other people um, you know, who opposed racism. I think he felt that he hadn't managed to do it. And I think that lived with him and he died with that sense of and if you look at his face in that last image I showed of him, it's of a man deeply lined, worn by years of fighting. And, um, you know, I have great empathy for, for the position that he was in. He believed in resistance, in a liberal democracy. He believed in non-racialism. He believed in the rights of all people. And he believed that everybody was of value. But unfortunately, this time in which he lived was not sympathetic to that ethos. And you mustn't forget that the gray shirts, um, even to the right of the, um, of the South African government were neo-Nazis who linked up with, uh, with, the, the, with, with Hitler. That was what they looked to. And uh, you know, there is a, I mean, that is, I'm afraid, the reality that South Africa has to remember. And I think it was something that, that lived with him despite the fact that he had worked so hard against it. My comment, just to let you know, wasn't a criticism of you, I promise. No, no, I understand. It was just an observation. Of course. Terry, thank you. Thank you so much for that. I think it's really, it's really beautiful for us to hear from family members. And, and I think to just have a sense of, you know, as scholars, we, we particularly in the arts and humanities, we, we're forever poking our noses into other people's business and digging around in archives and pulling out stories and trying to decide how to tell them or what to tell. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a very similar thing, I know, with, with, with journalism and also with the arts of poetry um, and novelists. Um, and I think there's something really important about just trying to weigh these difficulties of you know, lives lived in struggle that where the struggle seems to be forever and ever and ever without end. And I'm really kind of touched by that image of the, the, the last one you showed, Martin, of this man worn, worn down by the struggle, but also how, um, how important it is um, to, 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 to hold that sense of failure and also that sense of defeat um, within a life that was clearly lived well within, what was it you said, Martin, the great pure principles of love. Um, I've just seen in the chat that there's one more question. We've got a couple of minutes left. Um, so I'm going to ask, um, is it William or Wilhelmina? I can't actually tell from your name, um, but if you want to un unmute and comment and then we'll start to wrap this up for the end of, of um, the session. Uh, are you talking to me, William? Yes, William, sorry. It's, it looked like Wilhelmina on my chat. <laughs> Well, I'm, it's William Hendricks here. I'm uh, Abdullah's, I'm Terry's brother, William, uh, Abdullah's uh, one of his grandchildren. A uh, couple things. Um, the, the person that I'm most in awe of is, I think it's my great great grandfather, the slave, who somehow got his freedom and really, I think, laid the foundation for everything. Um, I don't know how he did it, sent his grandson to Alhazar and then my great grandfather to Scotland. That's a story that fascinates me. But I do think that my grandfather did feel failure, of course. I've learned more today than I ever learned in my whole life. 
because I can tell you my grandmother spoke almost nothing and my mother spoke almost nothing throughout her, my whole life about my grandfather. And my family has almost told me very little about my grandfather. And I'm extraordinarily grateful, I mean, extraordinarily grateful to Martin for what he's done because he has resurrected our grandfather's memory more than any other person, more than anyone. I, I, I'm, I'm 71 and I'm glad, I mean, I never imagined anyone would have done this before I died and Martin, I have to just thank you. I've told you this before that this has happened before I passed and I just want to go on record and let my family know that we uh, must be extraordinarily grateful to you. Thank you very much. Well, uh, to be honest, I'm extremely grateful to, to you because you've cooperated and sent me a lot of photos. Many of the photographs that we've used in, in the book um, are from your family and your family archive. And I'm really grateful for, for the co cooperation and collaboration and encouragement that you've given um, because, you know, it is, it, it's, it's really hard to, to do this work um, with, without the family's help. And I, I, you know, I'm really, really grateful for, for what you- I just have to warn you though, there's great sensitivity in the family about all of this. And I'm not sure that you've heard the last. And um, you, may, you may hear some things from other members of the family that, um, that, that there's, there's, I regret that there may be some things that other members of the family who disagree with me but, but I mean, you know, that that is part of the uh, journalistic or academic uh, process is that people will criticize you, will, will debate with you, will tell you that you're wrong. And believe me, there's nothing that your family can say about me that people haven't said in the past. Uh, I mean, <laughs> absolutely nothing. I just uh, I just want to let you know there's great sensitivity. There have been arguments in the family. And... Um, Anyway, enough said. Thank you very much, Martin. William, William, thanks so much for those comments and Terry as well. And thank you for speaking um, you know, with, and, with and from the family. And I think you're, you, you sound like you're describing everyone's family um, as, a, as a place where there's always huge disagreement about which version of the family story is the correct one. And of course that then goes to the heart of what the historical endeavor is about. And there's another branch to the family and that's the Hendrixie branch of the family that's also been involved with politics. Right. So I'm extraordinarily divided on yeah. that there's the Hendrixie branch of the family and the whole swimming thing that has caused a lot of issues and divided issues and the whole issue of black colored, it goes on. It goes anyway. on. And it, and it is where those, those you words know who are. I'm talking about. Anyway, enough said. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, William. Um, I'm, I'm going to move this to, to its end because um, we're coming up to um, 3.30 and I'm actually going to um, move it to its end again, just thinking about that, um, you know, that call to the great principles of love and, um, and with a, a thanks to Martin for the work he's done. But before I do that, I'd just like to invite Tawana to maybe respond with a poem. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I, uh, I think we are, we are all really um, in experiencing, witnessing, being part of something very, very uh, special today. And uh, I want to thank the family for um, coming in and, and, and shedding more um, or, you know, expressing um, what they're feeling about this. So I, I really, um, and I'll say to Martin that I'm, um, Hopefully this journey will, uh, there will be many friends and there'll be many adversaries, shall we say, but um, you have seen what this has started the moment with uh, someone having the street name next to them. And then now they're able to fill in that gap. This is all these moments, you know, we can take them away because at the moment we are in, in Scotland talking a lot about, or in the UK in general about what public monuments or signs mean. And, you know, there are all these conversations. Are they, are they evidence of what happened or are they, you know, so <clears throat> there's they all that to go. But yeah, I, um, <clears throat> I will just share a short poem, but I'll, I'll do, 
a, a short song before I start the poem. The song I'm going to sing is about a traveler and um, the traveler is, there's a proverb that the traveler has the greatest uh, home because wherever they roam, they, they are welcomed. And so the, the, the whole open world is their home in a way. So this is a song about the traveler. Before I go into the poem, And uh, I, should not, uh, <clears throat> I should not forget to thank everyone who's been present with us with, uh, with the chat. And even if you've not put anything in the chat, your presence has, has been uh, very much welcome today. Kunye pam chazandida. Jiri rini morufuta. Jiri rini morufuta. Kunye pam chazandida. Kunye pam chazandida. Deep in rhetoric lies a hero with no impact, no reputation no status, a hero with no name. Far from the limelight, in the blind spot of history, rests a hero, a hero with no face, no significance, a hero with no fame, completely out of view, out of the camera shot, resides a hero with no relevance, a hero with no acclaim. Hidden behind the calendar, is a day, a day without a date, without celebration, without fun. A day for the hero, hero with no name. Thank you. Ekani, thank you. Thank you, Tawana, for those words. And, um, and, and it really just remains to me, for me to say again, uh, a thanks to everyone who's worked very hard behind the scenes to put this event together. Um, they don't just happen at the click of a Zoom switch. Um, so particularly to Bella and to Lauren for the work they've done behind the scenes and the Equality and Diversity Unit at the University of Glasgow that's been organizing together with um, the Students' Union um, some of our events linked to the University of Glasgow for Black History Month. Um, we are naming our newest building and largest building uh, after an, Afri uh, an African-American born a slave who was the first to gain an MD from the University of Glasgow. Um, that story has begun to be told since 2014. Um, but this story, the story that you have told today, Martin, of a hero perhaps with no name or with a name that was forgotten in the 1940s, um, is one that you've brought back to the attention of the University of Glasgow, not least through the emails to myself and Ben White, asking for access to our archives in the library and sharing with us a story of our home that we didn't know either. Um, so we're immensely grateful to you from the institution for the work that you've done as a journalist and a, as a historian, as a scholar and a researcher into the life of this extraordinary man. Um, I think it is um, no accident that this is a moment in history when this is the life of a man that we need to sit with, linger with, whose words we need to read and whose legacy we need to think with. Um, and so on behalf of the University of Glasgow, the UNESCO team at the University of Glasgow and um, everyone here, I'd just like to express my thanks to you, Martin, for your work and to assure everybody that the slides and the recording and details about how you can buy the book, um, how you can buy the book for your own libraries, those of you who are academics, how you can do that will all be shared um, both through the Eventbrite links um, that you've all signed up to, but also on our website at the University of Glasgow um, and that I'm sure you can tell that Martin um, is a man of huge generosity he's put a lot of 
um, blood and sweat and tears, no doubt, into this particular book, as he does with so many other struggles around the world. And I know, you know, Hiab Johannes is in the room here, um, you know, really in solidarity with your work with Eritrea as well. And we just want to thank you for that and the way that you, in some ways, embody that spirit of struggle without end. Um, and those great principles of, great pure principles of love um, that you've brought to bear with this work. So I'm going to let Tawana give us some music and play us out. Um... <laughs>